Hey guys, um, I'm Tiffany Bradley and this is Colored Criticism. Uh, we are joined, there she is, by Marcella Torres, who is in transit. Um, so if we have any connectivity issues, it's just quarantine internet. That's the way we're <laughs> living right now. Um, but I'm super excited to have Marcella on today and I'll give a brief bio and then read, read a little critical context and we'll go from there. Um, so born in Salt Lake City, Utah and residing in Chicago, Illinois, um, Marcella received a BA in sculpture intermedia and a BFA in art history from the University of Utah um, and continued their studies in performance school of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, Marcella has performed at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Performances is Alive in Miami, the Detroit Fringe Festival, Experimental Actions in Houston, and Time-Based Arts in Portland. Um, in 2020, Marcella uh, was planning to be a resident at Recess in Brooklyn, New York City, and Bemis C Center for Contemporary Arts in Omaha, Nebraska. Hopefully those wonderful <laughs> residencies will happen um, in in a future, in a coming future. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Marcella um, is a performance artist and uh, had a piece called Agentic Mode um, that she was performing recently that um, looks at martial arts, racialized violence and the body. And so in thinking about um, Marcella's work, I pulled out my handy dandy textbook, um, the Angela Davis Reader. Um, so for those of you who don't know, in addition to um, being a Black Panther and activist, um, Angela Davis also studied philosophy um, and has a strong focus in her writings on Marxist philosophy, um, looking at the prison industrial complex and violence against black and brown bodies. So I, um, I was thumbing through this book and actually um, I found an essay called Art on the Frontline that she wrote in 1985. Um, and so I, th I think looking um, at objectivity and subjectivity, this is an interesting framework. Um, she writes, art is a form of social consciousness, a special form of social consciousness that can potentially awaken an urge in those affected by it to creatively transform their oppressive environments. Art can function as a sensitizer and a catalyst, propelling people toward involvement in organized movements seeking to affect radical social change. Art is special because of its ability to influence feelings as well as knowledge. Um, jump a little bit, a little ellipses. Um, progressive art can assist people to learn not only about the objective forces at work in the society in which they live, but also about the intensely social character of their interior lives. Um, and so I think that's just an, an interesting place to start thinking about um, art and violence and society. So over to you, Marcella, tell us about your work um, before the COVID crisis and clearly you're en route. So your life and practice are changing as we speak. Yeah, thank you so much for reading that. I think that really helps to put a lot of things into perspective and think a little bit about um, how like our current um, sort of arts community is so based in social justice, right? And so much work is right now like protest work and the way that we think about like art being knowledge of course things are so like aesthetic and formalized and those things continue to be important but the way that they've really shaped sort of like black and brown um like uh political agendas as well is like a really great place to really start from and think from um so tell us about agentic mode tell us about what you were doing um as a performer and educator in chicago yeah, so um, Agentic Mode is like a 40 minute performance work um, that I had been making for the last two years. And um, the the goal was, um, like I'm originally from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I really wanted a way to sort of talk about different forms of violence, both like the real, 
like physical things that people are experiencing in their community as well as like sort of sometimes the more passive forms of violence that we experience on a day to day. And so um, agentic mode is a 45 minute long performance. Oh, fine. <laughs> that was a big <laughs> A bump. Um, a 45 minute long performance that uses both like martial arts and sort of self defense um, research to talk about the 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 similarities between uh, martial arts and sports and um, and um, wartime violence and like the psychology of wartime violence. Um, and so then this performance, like I said, is something that I've been making for the last two years and. Um, and it is a solo performance that it uses uh, like individual boxing bags that have embedded microphones. So then I'm able to make this like really intense soundscape that plays to like all the different, um, like all the different conversations about violence, right? So then there are five different sections in this performance work that um, have to do with the Cooper color code of awareness. And so then it's like uh, each color like references sort of like a different mind placement. So then the entire performance throughout the whole 40 minutes or so. Um, you're I have a question. Yeah. What's, what's the Cooper color code of awareness? Yeah, so the Cooper color code of awareness is, um, it is a mental tool that people like our um, policemen or um, like people in the army learn to use as a way to like then decide whether they're going to be using like deadly force and so then like it's trying to like figure out if you're in danger so you're trying to think about your awareness and so then like there are five different colors the first one is white and you're thinking like you're unaware and you're totally chill like you don't think that there's anything wrong yellow is like alert but like still relaxed orange is um you're like beginning to recognize that there's an issue. Red is then like you're alert and you're planning to like do something and black is you're under attack. And I thought that this like color code was really interesting because of its relation to like skin tone and race mm -hmm. as well. And so then like the performance itself follows five different sections that relate to these color codes. And so then people are going on like an, I would say like sort of like a, they're being guided through, um, through these feelings, you know, they're being guided from like white, like, oh, I'm in the gallery, everything's chill, I'm gonna go see art, to like being in a red zone where like all the lights are off, it's like only intensely red, the sound is super loud, like I am like yelling monologues and it becomes like this really intensive space. So, yeah, so that's what I've been working on for the last two years and have been uh, performing. And so when the COVID crisis hit, obviously um, you're usually based in Chicago and that city has been hard hit just like New York. Um, and certainly communities of color have been certainly super hard hit. So um, how, how are you thinking about your work um, going forward given? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Chicago is interesting because we are such a segregated place, you know, that like um, it has been hard hit, but it also is confusing, you know, like I live in mostly a Mexican neighborhood and it's not as present as one would think because we're not as dense maybe as New York. And so then it is present and people are trying to be as careful as they can, but it, it still is like this sort of like alienating effect of knowing that something's happening, but like, and feeling like it's breathing on your neck, but you don't know where it is mm. um yeah and so then with the work itself you know i was getting ready to like sort of finish it out and so then march and april i had sort of um a few engagements in utah and in arkansas that i was going to perform in and i was excited because they're like nicer places and i i was excited to do it in my hometown which i've never done before um and so like it's changed kind of a lot because i've been preparing to like do new work and this seems like a, like the break like a forceful mm -hmm. break to be like all right yeah we maybe need to think about this a little bit differently because being in this mindset of thinking about violence in all its different ways and researching it and being involved in martial arts it it does weigh on you and like after all this happening i, I i'm really 
excited to move into sort of like different ways to think about how to be related to the body and to like my race in a way that is maybe like a I mean it's always intense but maybe not the same way yeah um it's it's always intense so I think I'm able to screen share a still of your work um okay, yeah let's do it <laughs> let's try um uh and google's acting funny um let's see nope it doesn't want to do it false alarm we'll, <laughs> well we'll get there one day um, yeah. <laughs> but um guys you can see uh her website link is in the side um chat is to the side questions are to the bottom um so if you have questions for marcella um please ask away um but so uh you also have a role as an arts educator working um in chicago so in new york um the story has really been furloughs and firings um in a lot of institutions but when we talked before this you said that in Chicago, there have been varying responses. Yeah, it's been actually really interesting because I mean, in working in arts institutions, we often critique them and they don't always do a good job. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's it's just something that we know that working in the arts is intense. And so um, the institutions I work in, uh, I work at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And then I also work for an after school and then in school program uh, called CAPE. And it's been really fascinating because both of them have like tried to find creative ways to maintain all their staff. Um, and so like the MCA is going to continue to pay us until July, you know, and then if they can't open, they're going to have to figure something out. But like uh, the top 10 people who are the top highest paid people at the MCA are taking pay cuts, like about half, you know. Yeah. And that's and, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. And so then they're, they've given us a certain number that isn't necessarily arguable, but that's like the amount that will be paid. And like for somebody that's a very like free freelancer, you know, like we maybe only work two hours a day because we're doing tours for youth. Um, just being given a number and just knowing that like we're being thought of is really cool. Yeah. And, yeah. and we've continued to be able to do certain kinds of projects, which has also been very interesting and like fun to do. Um, so I'm doing family days with them and then also maybe doing some uh, school projects. And then my other position is allowing us to continue online. And so that's been really interesting to like, I, it's it's created these limitations where I'm trying to be like um, a better teacher, you know, like trying yeah. to be a better educator and they're like providing that ability, which has been really, really interesting. That's that's great to hear some great news from Chicago um, that uh, leadership is re I'll say realigning resources, right? Because mm -hmm. I would assume the budget is the same or less, but if folks at the top are taking a significant pay cut to make sure that folks at the bottom still have some employment, um, I think that leads to more resiliency down the line. Yeah. Um, so I that's, think so. Yeah. yeah, because I, I, to me, it seems like the arts really should be like creative and thoughtful about like about employment, you know, and so then it's weird to me when organizations are like, no, nope, we're going to we're going to fire everyone. It's like, I mean, if we're showing like if we're showing our work by like Howardina Pendel and like uh, Carrie James Marshall and like Anna Mendes and all these people, if organizations are showing this work, then they really shouldn't be doing that because it means that they are not believing in what they're showing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, a lot of the cuts have been made in um, departments that actually deal with the public, whether it's education or visitor services um, or marketing and comms. So you can have great art, but in the end, it's your staff that helps people interpret it and understand it. Um, and really welcome folks to your institution. So um, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm glad to hear a, a bright spot. <laughs> yeah, I think it's cool. I mean, I think it's an 
like I said, an interesting challenge because all these organizations have to be moved online largely. And who do you ask to do that? The same people that greet your visitors, mm -hmm. you know? And so it has to be the educators who's coming up with like fascinating ways for people to like connect with their museum and for the museum to continue to feel like contemporary. Yep. Otherwise it's just a room full of paintings that nobody can see right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I know you are also, or were in the process of developing work, um, looking at cigar culture and Catherine Dunham. And actually when we first talked about it, I didn't realize that it was Dunham um, inspired, which she's just like a, a force, a historical force of nature that pops up everywhere like Forrest Gump through like her arts world. Um, <laughs> so tell us about that. <laughs> um, hold on. Yeah, I think let's just wait for a second. Um, yeah, so like I, like I was saying, after making this work, like sort of like really delving into like something that I had been interested in for a long time to like really dissect violence and to like find a way to make it experiential for other people to like both see themselves, but also for, uh, other people who had experienced this kind of violence to like really take it in. It, it's time to do something else. And so like, I've definitely been thinking a lot about movement. Like a lot of my work is really movement based because it's martial arts based. And I was trying to think about like, what was a different way to be movement based and to like, also think about like, what are the things that I'm sort of chewing on? What are the things that I want to like, think about and um i think the relationship sometimes between arts and like sometimes it can feel like things are very very topical um and i want to like have something that didn't feel like too on the nose but was something that like was research-based and i want to like think a little bit more about like latinidad you know to think about like uh brownness and the ways in which people are connected to each other um, and both like unique and not connected to each other. And as a way to think about sort of like um, the border incarcerations that are occurring where like people are sort of like lumped all together um, for like sort of negative reasons when, when I don't think that those <laughs> reasons are negative, you know, um, being illegal is not necessarily like a reason to be incarcerated or being brown or being poor is not like a reason to be like treated poorly. And so I want to think about a way of, of unifying a group of people um, that felt like deeper than just that, you know, that felt maybe a little bit more celebratory. And so I've been, I've been like a, a cigar person for a long, for a few years now. And I've been thinking a lot about like, sort of like this idea of like, it's culture. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, an industry that's been in on uh, the Caribbean and now in on America and then now in like uh, Africa and all these other places um, that is, you know, this breathing in of earth, you know, a tobacco leaf um, is the, what it's made out of. And it comes from all these different parts of mostly Latin America. And when you breathe it in, it's like something that I think is very like, like an homage and origin space. It's a, or it's a, it's a ritual. And, I think that it was, it's a way for me to sort of think about like interconnectedness and yet difference. And are you still working on that or is everything just um, in flux as you <laughs> are on the road? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going actually home to my parents to quarantine with them. Um, but I think some of it's in flux but some of it, like I've had more time to research it and I have to think about what it is because like, yeah, a lot of my dates were canceled, but some of them were moved. And so mm -hmm. the momentary in Arkansas is actually going to premiere this work in December, which means I have to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're laughing because it's funny and because often artists sell things that don't exist yet. But it will. <laughs> it will. It will exist. It will but, you exist. Know, the way, like, for me, performance works is I often, um, like, cr have a planning period, you know, where you're applying for funds. And so, like, I'm, like, applying for funds and, like, applying for places and trying to figure out how it is so then I can spend time, like, just working on it. So, like, now that it has a due date and it, I have received some funds for it um, through the city of Chicago. 
And so like now I have to just nest and like make it. And so that's cool. There's the, I've been doing a lot of research specifically with like um, we were speaking, speaking about Catherine Dunham and making it more of a dance piece because she would create these like really amazing uh, productions uh, that were like her Negro ballet. I believe that's what it was called. And um, they would be smoking live cigars and they would be like passing it through their mouths. And they were also using it like as a cultural symbolism of like Caribbean life and, and Latin American um, upbringing, but also Afro Latin, you know? And so then like that interconnection as well. Yeah. And um, for the audience who may not be Dunham scholars or super fans, um, Catherine Dunham was a dancer, anthropologist, and um, I guess sort of actress. She had a stint in Hollywood where she did all of this choreography um, for what were then the Negro pictures um, in the World War II period. Um, and so she did field work in Trinidad, Haiti, Jamaica. Um, on Caribbean dance. Um, she was born, I think, in the Midwest, um, uh -huh. uh, but she was a Black American who, actually her thesis is called Dances of Haiti, um, who really, I think, shaped how Americans, and especially Black Americans, think of Caribbean dance. Um, and she, had a company and created a choreographic framework called the Dunham Method um, mm -hmm. that really is still taught today. And that's really how Americans learn Caribbean dance. Um, and there are lots of academic and cultural <laughs> disputes about um, her work in various and sundry ways. But mm -hmm. I think um, like Alan Lomax who recorded so much Southern Black music, she created a body of work um, that would not have been captured without her intervention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in a, in a way that folklore wasn't being taken seriously and Afro-Caribbean folklore traditions were not a site of study. So that's, that's just like the nerdy framework if you're tuning in and <laughs> and are not an art critic yeah. or performance artist. Um. <laughs> but yeah, and I think along with that, I think that's really why she wanted to call it, like have the word ballet in it to like really heighten the form. So not only was it like folk things that she was collecting, like folk movements and, and dance and um, social dance, but like then creating sort of like these really high art pieces with like that as its backbone. And so then like looking at the at the technique, the denim technique has been really interesting because yeah, we see it. I mean, it's it's still dance that we see now, you know, and it's um, being broken down in these really like intense ways. But like, it's funny because it's sometimes I've been taking some ballet classes and it's like about like the form of your foot and how strong your foot is. And then like, I was also doing some of the denim things and it's like a body roll, <laughs> you know? And like, it takes sort of the same sort of like isolations and like being able to have control over different parts of your body and like hold it and then like roll through it and so it's really fascinating because they're they're all really similar in a way to, about like a, a control of your body yeah and and um so i will say there's a huge crossover between people trained in martial arts and people trained in ballet like it's it's something that tends to go back and forth but this is a good time to talk about muay thai and how that's been part of your practice or experience yeah i think that i um as a maker i, I am very technical but like I'm, I'm not technical in the way of like making woodwork or things like that i think i was always looking for something that was a, a framework a structure that i could use and then like manipulate and that structure seemed to be the martial arts you know because it, it holds a lot of different things so it's both about like the control of your body, like making sure like the elbow is right, the knee is right, like the, the hit is right, but also like being able to respond at any given moment and there being a level of risk there that I think was important for this previous work, you know, thinking about different kinds of violence, there need to be like an actual real risk. Mm -hmm. But um, but Muay Thai has been really interesting because that's kind of what I came in as thinking about like needing a framework to understand violence and to show violence, but just as much involved in that is like camaraderie and care and teamwork and um consent 
And so Muay Thai, I've been training for the last five years. I really wanted to be part of this community and not feel like um, like a, some kind of uh, imposter. And so that's led mm -hmm. me to like be really deep. Like to, this has led me to like do amateur fighting, you know? So, and they're like separate in some ways, but I think that like, I really need to feel like I was really involved in order to, to make work about it. And so I've, I've done, I've been in two fights now and they're, um, and it's been really interesting because they were kind of like, I knew that they were going to be intense, but it's intense, you know, it's intense to be hit by somebody to like consent to, to be in a ring with somebody. And, and yeah, so I've just been taking a little break and longer than I had thought with this all happening. And it's given me some more time to like reflect on, on my sport, you know, like on this, yeah, on this, I mean, I don't know what else to say, but like about it, because it's a little more complicated, you know, like a sport that is like something that helps for me to like exercise, like my emotions and, and, and wants and, but also it's like also risky. And I like that as well. So it's like this really back and forth. So um, you're in the car, you're headed to new quarantine headquarters. Um, what are you looking to the future for and what do you hope for the future? And I'll say people, let's see, we're at like 25 minutes. So if you have questions, ask your questions now. Otherwise we'll, we'll wrap up on the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I feel confident in the, like the ability to make work and make it well. But what I'm looking for in the future is like a relationship to happiness. Um, and I think that like happiness is something that you build and you work on the same as like muscles or the same as like learning how to do Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can always get better at. And so like the last maybe six months of my life, I've been trying to have a relationship with happiness that is ongoing and on flowing. And so like for the future, I think I would continue to like want to have a lot of drive and to make work in, in a fullness but i think to like um ensure to maintain my my relationship with happiness that's amazing i think we'll just end it oh no eric oh that was such an awesome end and but we have a question okay from <laughs> which is any advice for new or young artists right now um yeah. other than cultivating a relationship with happiness which i think everybody um it, no, like that's that an that aspiration. I think that they're related. I think it's really important um, to like feel centered in yourself when you're a younger artist, because yeah. there's so much push to like get um, what we're accolades, right? And to feel validated. And so I think that to like find um, like a sense of like happiness and worth in yourself and in relationship to your work like helps to ground you as you like um, search for that sort of just search through accolades. Because I think that like, um, it's really, you know, once I graduated from graduate school, everyone's like, yeah, we're going to go out there and we're going to do it. We're going to get it done. And then we all got rejected nonstop, nonstop, like uh, all sorts of rejection. And that doesn't stop happening. No one ever like gets everything they want, but you have to feel like a sense of like centeredness in both the things that you make and also in yourself to like maintain like um moving forward at all at all times and so i would say for new artists um to be centered in your practice to be centered in yourself and to like have a group of people that you can have really hard conversations about your work with and um i think reading is super important and so like some people don't love to read but to like find a relationship to any kind of text that helps to to also ground and center your practice and so that that doesn't even have to be theory i think that that could be podcasts i think that could be like children's books i think that could be uh <laughs> youtube videos <laughs> like you know like but just yeah. have like text or reading or research that like helps to ground you yeah Let's see. um so we'll end on that. I also hear church bells ringing, which is like a lovely sound cue. Um, I I don't know why, because it's not on the hour, but maybe they're ringing like it's every perfect. half hour. Yeah, oh. I think that's what it is. We're in Cheyenne, Wyoming right now. Hey, and Wyoming. 
<laughs> and so yeah, I think it's a half hour. Got it. Okay, so the closing advice for the future is to cultivate a relationship with happiness um, and find a way to stay centered. And I think that is an amazing um, last word for today. Um, and we're actually magically at 30 minutes. So I want to thank Marcella Torres so incredibly much for checking in with us um, at <laughs> on the road in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, I think we'll have something tomorrow. I'm not sure. Check social media. But if not, you can always see um, Art Off Pause playlist on YouTube. And that's YouTube backslash Colored Criticism TV, which is a really long URL, but that's what YouTube gave us. And um, we'll embed the link to Marcella's website there. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so to Driver. Much. And we'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>